Hi, I'm Zach Harvey, co-founder and CEO of Lamasu. Uh, we make Bitcoin ATMs, BTMs, etc. Um, currently, um, have sold 250 and 90 are operating throughout the world. Hi, I am uh, Dominic, working for Bitcoin Vietnam, the first Bitcoin exchange in Vietnam. We are also collaborating with Eli and also with Jonathan on some projects. And yeah, the first Bitcoin exchange in Vietnam, also pushing the community there, and it's quite an adventure. So I'm Jonathan, Jonathan Ruash, uh, founder and CEO of Bits of Gold. Bits of Gold is an exchange in Israel that has expanded using collaborations to Vietnam, to Germany. We actually, I think, in some constellation, collaborate with each other uh, outside of Israel and in Israel. There's a Lamassu ATM at the embassy operated by Bits of Gold. Okay, great. So, um, I guess the main issue that's uh, really interesting to everyone is what's going on with the legal status of the exchanges around the world and we'll have a few minutes about it let's say what you think we can start in Israel right yeah so uh, actually I would like to know how many people here are in, in Israel and have used the services of one of us all right well wow, nice so uh, this is this is the proof that uh, it is working in some way. So we managed to have a, a continuity of service, uh, giving people access to Bitcoin, buying or selling. It's not an easy task. So we have to deal with the banks that are still wary of what is this Bitcoin. And uh, it is not very easy to have companies on such a small market uh, continue for such a long time. So here in Israel, the, the status would be, uh, let's say, orange. It works, but it's fragile. And we're all working to make it less fragile and uh, more robust. I'll add to this point that um, the general feeling from the banks in Israel is that um, they don't like it. And they have tried to stop us from working, try to reduce our capabilities. And because of the fact that uh, Bitcoin is not illegal and we have, to, we have the right to, to make that kind of business, we're still operating. And Hopefully it will be, it will change soon, and it will be okay. The, the operating part should continue, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the plan. What about a little bit in, uh, what's going on in Vietnam? Yeah, so far in Vietnam there's also no official regulation. The only thing you had is so far uh, in back in February, the state bank said, it's not a legal tender, not a legal means of payment, so basically just copying what all the other central banks around the world also have said. We don't have any issues with the bank, they just don't care. And in general, the state bank is quite skeptical about Bitcoin, for sure. You also have some capital controls in Vietnam, and of course they see that people just could circumvent it. Um, Maybe they'll start caring when big money starts flowing there. I mean, basically, in Vietnam, you can, people are just doing everything which they want to do. Um, gold shops, for example, you can exchange your foreign exchange at gold shops at every corner, even if they are not allowed to do so. Vietnam works a bit different in this way. Uh, of course, still we try to do it a lettered way. We're also um, talking to the state bank, and we were also talking to the cybercrime unit of the Department of Public Security. Those guys understood quite well that it doesn't really make sense to go after us because everything they don't like to happen would happen anyway in the underground. In fact, the underground market in Vietnam is much huger than what is going on on our exchanges because the people are just posting on Facebook, some tech forums, their phone numbers. and So the P2P underground market is probably two orders of magnitude higher than what you see uh, going on on our exchanges at the moment. 
and you also have a lot of huge miners from two or three years back and they want to stay anonymous because they have invested quite a lot of money and they also trade just where they trusted middlemen and somehow connected them to BTCE and move the money on secret ways out of the country and uh, but what about the regulator and the banks they don't have um, the incentive to bring this stuff up from the from the so-called black market the banks themselves are quite interested in Bitcoin there we are talked to some C-level executives at the banks, and they are really interested to make some money with it. Um, but they are still hesitating because the state bank, of course, is quite skeptical to Bitcoin, and they don't want to risk their business by going into Bitcoin now. But we didn't face any issues with the banks so far, so this is quite different from the Western point of view. Zach, what about cash? Any problems? Well, there's something uh, special about cash, of course, that um, you don't necessarily require banks to deal with cash. That's one thing that cash and Bitcoin have in common. Uh, the use case is is peer to peer. If I want to give you five dollars uh, or twenty shekels, I don't need a bank to do that. I can just hand it right over to you in the same way we do it with Bitcoin. Um, so I think there are two things when when thinking about what's happening with banks. Part of them is you know there are banks out there that don't like Bitcoin. And then there are banks out there that it doesn't really matter if they like Bitcoin or not. It's just not worth it for them. The only thing they, you know, the, the one thing that they're truly concerned about is the regulatory environment. And if they have this Bitcoin thing going on that could screw things up for them, they're not going to get anywhere near it. Um, so we have been seeing certain things, you know, certain uh, Bitcoin businesses throughout the world who have encountered what I call death by bank, um, which is you have... Uh, a Bitcoin business and all of a sudden, you know, your, your banking relations just get shut down. They're like, yeah, we're not going to work with this anymore. And then what do you do? It's very hard to have an online service with, uh, without dealing with, dealing with virtual fiat. There's, there's no way to really do that. And that's where Bitcoin ATMs have a certain advantage because we use cash. So um, in, in any case where cash is preferable to virtual um, fiat, virtual government currency, um, our machines uh, really come in handy. So we can have machines that don't need banks at all. When it's cash in and cash out, you can just kind of balance it. Um, you don't need to deal with, with banks at all. Um, the other thing, I'm, in most countries, we've shipped to about, well, over 40 countries, and there have only been two countries where Bitcoin has pretty much been illegal. And we shipped one machine to Ecuador, and about a week after um, it got there, they basically announced Bitcoin as being illegal because they want to have their own uh, digital currency. Um, and then that machine was later on shipped to Mexico. We had a machine that we shipped to Russia, and the operators of the machine did not want to get into that because they felt that the environment wasn't, wasn't there. Um, and they shipped the machine to uh, Kiev, Ukraine, where it's now operating. And all the other countries, it's just mostly a matter of figuring out um, what kind of AML and KYC requirements are required. So as far as the government's concerned, it's usually not a problem. And the advantage of Bitcoin ATMs is that you don't necessarily have to be concerned as much about um, banking relations. Sure. You want to say something? Yeah, so we actually consider cash as a, a fail-safe mechanism for the entire industry. The day, if the day comes that a bank is creating problems, you know that cash will still be there. But it's true that you uh, need to continue to have a very strict AML uh, regime so that nobody can come and claim, okay, you're using this machine to do uh, you know, money laundering. So uh, coming back to, to Vietnam, I think one of the reasons for uh, the banks to be less wary of what you guys are doing is that uh, you're applying a KYC regime that it has never been seen in Vietnam. So uh, these guys are working to the standards of, of the in international community and uh, specifically what we uh, implemented here in Israel uh, and coming from, uh, you know, from uh, the regulation in Europe and the United States. This is something that Vietnamese are not used to, giving so many uh, copies of their identities and, and stuff like that. Uh, but this is something that we see around the world slowly. Uh, there is no, uh, or there are less and less places where you can do Bitcoin exchange and not uh, reveal your identity. So it's a shift from where we were, uh, let's say, two years ago, where you could 
maybe find a place to move large amounts of money with Bitcoins. Today, a uh, large focus of what we're doing is to explain to people that uh, this is a very legit business. And if you have, if there is some form of doubt, none of these people want to do business with you and uh, probably will not find, uh, you know, a, a, a business that will do business with you. You will need to find maybe uh, somebody off the street, but that's also disappearing slowly. So the focus has become a uh, very strict uh, KYC uh, mechanism. We see this in uh, Bitstamp, I think. Bitstamp have now announced that... Yeah, they did. They're threatening their, their customers to close their accounts if they don't fulfill the KYC. Right, so we're, seeing, we're actually seeing clients saying, okay, so getting uh, verified at Bitstamp for an Israeli is a little bit more complex. So we want to get verified with you guys and just, okay, we want to, to ship back the money uh, to Israel through uh, your companies. We actually did the same thing uh, just the beginning of uh, last month. Uh, the banks with the lawyers attached with the regulators, they wanted to um, settle this thing of the KYC. So. We had to recollect from all our customers IDs and the uh, appendix of the IDs of the Israelis. Even though B2C is only restricted for Israelis, we are well monitored and watched. And another thing I wanted to ask you guys is um, we talked about cash, we talked about the banks. What about uh, credit cards? There's a lot of companies under the banks or beside the banks that move a lot of money with credit cards and we uh, in B2C are starting to experiment with this even though it's been it's been real tough. What do you think where, where, where this where this thing is going? Well I think uh, with credit cards you, you in a sense have the same issues as dealing again with the banks. I mean, you can't have a credit card without a financial institution. So in that sense, uh, credit cards are very different from cash. The other problem with credit cards is, of course, the, um, the back charges. So somebody can go and buy Bitcoin with a credit card and then, um, and then claim that he got nothing in return. Yeah, but do you think that that's what held the use of credit card till now? Do you think it's, gonna, it's, gonna, it's going for a solution? It's going... It's going to be, we think... I mean, there's, there's something it's very convenient, of course, about credit cards, especially in, in countries um, like the U.S. and Israel, where credit cards are very popular. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think it has more of the qualities, in a sense, of an exchange um, than of, a, uh, of, say, cash. So if you have an app on your phone, like a Coinbase or, a Coinbase or a Bits of Gold app on your phone, you can just go on your phone and immediately um, buy the Bitcoin. Uh, there's something, you know, there's something, I think uh, Circle have just also made it very easy to um, buy Bitcoin with a credit card. And in some ways, maybe it's quicker, uh, quicker onboarding, and there may be some advantages to it. But I think it has uh, many of the same advantages, uh, uh, disadvantages, of, um, of dealing with virtual currency and having to work with financial institutions and not really being able to get to people who don't use credit cards as much. So that's true. Uh, I think there are two aspects to credit cards that you should distinguish. One is uh, inbound and outbound, right? So if you are at a, you hold money at an exchange and you want to use your dollar say, uh, I know that there have been solutions to cash out your money using credit cards. This is a very simple way for people to, to take money out of the exchanges without doing all the international transfers. And that's been, I think, on for a while. And the, the onboarding part, which is the part that brings people in using their credit card, this is actually, I think, a requirement to have Bitcoin more mainstream. People today are used to not going out of their house use their credit cards, uh, just send the, send the number if they're online or swipe it. And this is, this is the, the gesture that people are used to. So today we still have to deal with that. And luckily we have you know, in Israel a very nice ecosystem of, uh, of startups 
uh, one of the startups uh, here in Israel, Simplex CC, is working specifically on that on that subject to you know, green light or red light uh, a specific transaction for an exchange. If if we at Pizza of Gold receive uh, someone new that wants to buy, let's say, five hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin, then uh, we will send all the information that we can send to say Simplex CC. They will approve or disapprove this specific transaction based on the data that they can gather by themselves or from what we give them. And if they approve, they take the counterpart risk. So there are uh, beginning to be solutions. Of course, all this is for a fee, so you have a trade-off of convenience versus fee, which I, I think you can, uh, you can probably see that the convenience of people uh, uploading money to the platform immediately is something that's, that people are willing to pay a certain number of percentage. Well, part of the reason uh, we at uh, PTC started to investigate this thing is the demand from the customers mm -hmm. about credit cards. There's also demand about cash. Um, generally, I get the feeling that people don't like to do items first. So, it's always a question about cash, about credit cards. And I think they're going to get uh, eventually what they need and what they want. Yeah, the environment in Vietnam regarding this is a bit different because it's really largely cash-based society, so it really matters more for cash than uh, credit cards. Another problem with credit cards in Vietnam is that the numbers of credit card fraud in Vietnam are five times higher than the average in the region. What's the reason why in general? So uh, right now there's no way to, to buy bitcoins with uh, credit cards with us, but we are looking into a partnership with a payment provider which is uh, established in Vietnam to yeah, do this, these kind of payments via this payment provider so we don't face any risk with this. Right now ourselves we didn't go into the risk to accept credit card payments because yeah, like I said, credit card fraud is rampant and it's not the people who use credit cards also can use cash, which is more safe for us because once we have the cash in hand, it's the cash in hand, no cash. Did you try to investigate a little bit why why the fraud rate is so high over there? We didn't do our own uh, investigations, but in general, in Vietnam, it's really quite common that people, and you see regularly headlines popping up that large rings of uh, people from Vietnam somehow stole credit card data and bought a lot of stuff in the US and wherever, and they just sent in their persons where they shipped the items to, and you have such headlines nearly every month. I'm not sure why it's exactly now Vietnam where this is so random, but uh, but just to correct, they have very uh, large amounts of legit stuff. I was addicted to Flappy Bird for three months. This came from Vietnam. So it's not just for... Okay, so... Um, we guys, we can talk about uh, this stuff uh, for whole, the whole day, right? And I wanted to see if anyone has uh, questions for us. Yeah, sure. So the question to repeat, there's a very high spread on our platform on bits of gold. Uh, maybe you want the reasons for that and the way to go forward to lower this spread. So the basic reason for a spread at our company, uh, we don't like this, this, these numbers. It's, uh, it takes clients away from, from our platform, so we, we're trying to change that. The basic reason is trying to predict the direction of the market. Uh, we're not uh, an exchange where people bring their dollars or shekel and bring their bitcoins and try to find the price. This is uh, what B2C are doing and doing successfully. We are mostly importing Bitcoin from abroad. So most of the price is the price of uh, sending your, converting your shekels to dollars and sending them abroad, or convert, taking from abroad, uh, let's say from Bitstamp, and converting it back. So most of those of this spread is uh, cost. And if you, if we were able to predict 
the general direction of the market, if it's mostly buying or mostly selling, we could tighten it. But for the past months, it has been very difficult to understand where this market is going, and this spread reflects that. Now, having said that, we are not going to stay with those numbers for a long time. We have, uh, specifically for higher, uh, higher amounts of, uh, of transactions, so the transactions that we see are coming now from high net worth individuals that are uh, buying you know, by the tens of thousands of dollars. These, these spreads are not uh, there for, uh, for long. We, we're beginning to have uh, channels this is uh, too soon to announce, but it's, uh, it's already in a, in a pilot phase, beginning to have channels to have uh, much uh, streamlined uh, liquidity coming in, and the spreads will be uh, lower. So again, it's, a, it's maybe a sort of apology. We, what we want is to have a company that is here for the long term, so that people can buy and sell Bitcoins now, and in a year, and in five years, etc. So we're adapting ourselves to the market and, and the, the constraints of the market. I hope it answers your question. So in general, Israel is a small market and it takes time to build this infra infrastructure to lower the prices and lower the spread. That's, that's basically it. Anything else or we'll continue to chat a little bit more? Yeah. So I'm Shaul from Bits of Gold. Uh, my question is for Zach, actually. Do uh, you have any plans to make a ATM that actually recycles bills so that it would be more self-sufficient for uh, countries which are unbanked? Um, yes, it's definitely something that we're interested in. Um, in general, of, of oh yeah, sorry, I'll repeat the question. The question was if we have any plans to use our recycling module for our machine. A recycling module takes the cash going in, stores in, that is able to use that same cash and, and dispense it as well. And what that enables operators of the machine to do is they can, um, at least theoretically, put a machine on an island and then people just come in and out without having to use have any banking relations or possibly even services if you have the algorithms right to figure in the ins and outs. Uh, it would kind of be its own market making machine. Um, uh, the, the truth is the good recyclers are quite expensive. So the bank rate recyclers uh, for the machine itself would cost more than our, the, the total amount of our machines right now. So it's something we're, uh, we're looking into as kind of um, a high capacity premium machine. Um, but it's something that we also have to try to think of, you know, what people want to pay for these machines and, and where would they place where it really makes sense. Um, it's, uh, we do have uh, machines that have um, acceptors and dispensers separately, so you just need to have somebody who goes and, and takes the cash out of one and then separately puts into the other, which may be, at least in the beginning, cheaper than, than getting a dispenser. But um, it's definitely something that we're thinking about, and at the same time thinking about how we incorporate this in developing countries. I mean, there are two and a half billion unbanked people that we really want to get to that all use cash, and one of them don't have banks. So cash is really the only way to get to them. Um, on the other hand, um, the cost of manpower will be a lot lower than, say, a $15,000 machine for a while. So maybe there's a way to kind of use tablets, etc., cetera, or, or kind of get into, um, in a sense, human ATMs on that side and have the machines on uh, the sending side, and then you can have um, remittance services that can, that can be really fast. And, and without going through the banking system and have rates that are way lower than MoneyGram, Western Union, etc., way more convenient. Um, so I'm not sure that recyclers would definitely be the immediate solution to developing countries, um, but it's definitely something we're looking to with um, when it comes to, to remittance and, and handling cash in a more way. Thank you. Sure. Go ahead. You guys are obviously in a lot of different countries with a lot of jurisdictions. Um, I'm curious, two-part question, I guess. One, where are you seeing the highest volumes? And two, where is it easiest for your operators, so for, in terms of just getting set up? Uh, so it, 
And, and is there a correlation between high volume and, and easy jurisdiction to get set up? All right, thanks, Gabe. Uh, two quest, two part question. The first question is where are we seeing the most volume through our machines, and the second one is um, how easy it is to to operate the machines from a regulatory standpoint, and if there's any correlation between the two. Um, so the first part is we're seeing um, the most volume in Canada. Actually, we've also sold the most machines to Canada, um, way more than we've actually sold to the U.S. and more than any other country. Um, we are seeing um, anywhere that our machines are placed, whether you know five, six machines in Montreal, the same in Ontario, they're all doing well, they're all profitable. Um, and then on the other hand, we do have machines that are launched in the U.S., which takes a lot longer due to the, the um, um, regulatory environment in the U.S. Um, it takes our operators a lot longer to usually to get set up, depending on the state, of course. But once they do, they see high volume as well. On, on the machines we had in Massachusetts, right around um, Harvard and MIT, are doing very well. The machine we have in New York City is doing well. Um, but actually, pretty much everywhere in the world where our machines are located, as long as they're in a, in, in a convenient place for people to get to, high foot traffic areas, they're doing well. So our machine, uh, we just had a machine that launched in, in Budapest and Hungary, and it's doing great. Um, and it wasn't too difficult for them from a regulatory standpoint. Same um, in Hong Kong, um, we have several machines that are, that are doing great. Um, Australia is the same. Uh, we have a lot of machines there that are doing very well. It's, and up until this point, it's been very simple from a regulatory standpoint. And there's now a new the issue. Bitcoin embassy, uh, too. In the back. And, of course, the Bitcoin, Bitcoin embassy, embassy in Israel. Bitcoin embassy in Israel. It's going to be fun. Right. <laughs> We see, we see, we actually see people coming in, you know, there was a line of people wanting to buy the, the Bitcoins and sometimes you have these, uh, these moments where you need to replenish your, your ATM machine and then you need to wait for a block. And we, we have these situations where people are in line, everybody's waiting for a block and this is a, a call for all the entrepreneurs in the room who are thinking of making a block waiting game. <laughs> so while you're waiting for your block, you will be a massive online block waiting game. We're still figuring out the, how to make it fun, but you need to wait for that block to confirm in order to replenish your ATM machine. I have another small question, and it was interesting what you said about Canada. Do you, you know why, why the Canadian is so into ATMs? Um, well, first of all, like the U.S. Um, and Israel, they're very entrepreneurial, um, and it sometimes seems that other places in the world, like for instance Europe, are a little slower to the game as far as entrepreneurism is concerned. So they kind of have the, um, the North American entrepreneurial spirit, but on the other hand, um, their government isn't as harsh when it comes to financial regulation, so they're a lot more laid back. So while in the U.S. people have concerns that if I do something a bit wrong, I'll be threatened with 20 or 30 years in jail, in Canada they don't have that same concern. They can start doing something, and if there's an issue, they'll go and, and talk to their regulators and figure it out amicably, um, which in, in the U.S. isn't the case. So I think that's the reason that, that um, it hasn't exploded as quickly in the U.S. It's starting to ramp up a, a bit more now, um, but in Canada, just right off the bat, um, I mean, I think we, we've shipped about 40, 50 machines to Canada, and they're, you know, one by one, they're, they're launching, and that's way more than any other country. I think second place is probably Australia, which is, you know, I mean, uh, not sure exactly why, maybe, the, you know, it, it always seems like the English-speaking countries are, are a bit more entrepreneurial. Um, but uh, Australia as well, I mean, we, we uh, have more, you know, per capita, of course. Uh, more than you know, pretty much any country besides Canada. That's cool. Yeah, so yeah. I, I have one last comment about, you know, we're, we're discussing about uh, uh, buying Bitcoins and selling Bitcoins at the consumer level, but what we're not discussing and not seeing on our exchanges are the very large transactions that are happening uh, OTC, over the counter. So those, those transactions are moving uh, millions of dollars every day and they use the prices 
of the exchanges of the world to move the money around. This is a, in the, in the financial world, it's, uh, they look at it as a bit of a problem because when you look at volumes on the largest exchanges, those volumes, if you have an amount of, uh, sufficient amount of money, you could use that money to lower the price at the official exchange and then go and do your OTC transaction on, uh, behind the scenes. So this is something that you know, we, we don't usually discuss, but it's happening as we speak. It's one of the explanations that people are, uh, are moving forward to explain the, the really crazy rate variation of, of these. You, are, you have a theory about the experiment? It's, it's not my theory, but I, I actually happen to have some data points that show that there, there is a, a large, large, there are large transactions going on in parallel to what we know in our exchanges in, in, the, in the exchanges in, in the world. I think that triggered a very uh, interested question over there. You immediately raise your hand. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes, I want your comment on the ability of the large exchanges, like the three big exchanges in China that are able to manipulate the prices with uh, things that are not on the blockchain. And I want to hear your... Uh, so, uh, the question was, are Chinese exchanges able to manipulate data because... Uh, so you said not on the blockchain, I will correct that. The blockchain is just a settlement uh, place where Bitcoins are moving around. But those places are publishing their data uh, in an open manner. The data might be very opaque, but the, the publishing is open. So I don't have any comment on, on those, uh, those exchanges. I don't, I, I've heard you know, rumors on practices where you would have the volume packed at 20,000 bitcoins minimum, and then it's 20,100, 20,050, and you yeah, have let, let me say it out loud. I don't believe their volumes. I don't. Yeah, I think they're lying. It's, it's something that you can do when you're still in an unregulated world where uh, people are looking at those rates as if they're information, but the rate is uh, not overseen by you know, sufficient, uh, uh, sufficient tools to reassure you that this is legit. It's very easy to reject you know, uh, small transactions to move the volumes. Uh, regarding rate, the rate variation, this is, I believe most laws around the world would go against that uh, as it is right now. So I don't think it's lawful to, uh, to go around and manipulate rates when you, when you have a stake. But you know, I'm not a lawyer and this is, this is where the industry is very, very young and has a lot to uh, to Well, I think more than solving this by, by laws, one solution is more decentralization. And as we remember from the Mt. Gox days, uh, when, when the price was 30 and started crashing, they shut down. There wasn't a Bitcoin price all of a sudden. And everybody relied on their numbers for the price. And now it's a little bit better. You have a few more exchanges. But in essence, it's still the same issue. You have several centralized exchanges who are, you know, their price discoveries. But we did move from one big exchange to, to three. Right. Like four. Right, it's a good start. Um, do you think it's gonna keep decentralizing the, the exchange? Well, right. Well, yeah. I mean, Shao uh, mentioned the um, the kind of self-sufficient uh, Bitcoin ATMs. We start seeing those popping up all, all around. They can have their own price discovery systems, and then instead of having four, five, ten exchanges, you have thousands of micro exchanges all over. And it's a lot more honest. And I mean, another issue with exchanges that people have to be concerned about is fractional reserve. When they're not supposed to be, are they? Do they actually have all the money? Do they have the thousand dollars you put in there? Do right. they actually exactly. kind of just using that to manipulate the market? So there are several exchanges that have gone out of their way to kind of prove that they're not fractional reserve. I, I think it's going to be a standard very soon. Uh, well, it's I it's custom. I know of uh, CoinFloor in the UK that have done it. And um, Kraken have done it as well, I believe. And do, do you guys think we are also doing? Yeah, are we over Gox now? I mean, it's uh, it's been it's been a while, right? Are we officially over Gox, or is it going to to weigh on on our you know uh, sphere for a very long time? I, I actually want to know what the the public thinks about it. Is 
Is Gox a distant, Mount Gox a distant memory or is it very vivid? Uh, so raise your hand. Okay, uh, Jonathan. We'll try to find out during the rest of the conference because our time is up. So thank you very much, guys. It was always a pleasure. Thank you guys for your time.